I just want to say uh, welcome to uh, the people who have just joined. Uh, we've had a fantastic day of discussion. It's just been like, wow. So much to take in, to comment on. Um, lots of thoughts and perspectives, ideas, conversations, all sorts for us to just reflect on um, after the conference has ended. Um, this is our final panel discussion of the day. It's uh, our local educators. We specifically put this on today because we want to engage more with local teachers. Um, we believe that the conversation starts with children at a very young age, as we, as, um, we were just discussing earlier. Um, and so this is an opportunity for anybody who works in uh, primary um, and secondary education to have a say on, on addressing perspectives of race in education. So our panel today, um, we have Julie Walters Nisbet, who is the chair of the local... local Leicester Black Teachers Network. There we go. We have uh, Robert Howell from Judge Meadow Community College. It is, yes. It is, yes. And... Um, <laughs> Riaz Lahair from the Madani Academy and also Camille London Mayo from the Lancaster School. So I'll take it over to you, Julie. Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon, all. My big question today is how can black and ethnic minority teachers be more involved in the next curriculum review in order to ensure that the curriculum starts to reflect the diversity of our global majority here in the UK? It was here at the um, Stephen Lawrence Centre at the launch where we discussed the fact that one of the recommendations of the McPherson report was to have a more um, revised national curriculum to prevent racism and value cultural diversity, to get school governors and local education authorities to create strategies for dealing with racist incidents. And 20 years on from that, unfortunately, the review of the national curriculum in 2011 led by Tim Oates, um, a CBE from Cambridge, got rid of most of the opportunities that us as secondary teachers had to make our curriculum more inclusive. I've been talking to colleagues and some of the suggestions that they've come up with is, involves things from us becoming school governors, either as staff or parents, us getting into exam boards and becoming markers and moderators and chief examiners, but we need to think of more strategic ways for us to be represented. Our children have been turned off of the curriculum. And my English colleagues in particular talk about the fact that they now have to read these traditional English texts, whereas To Kill a Mockingbird gave them access to discuss race with lots of y black youngsters, black boys in particular, who underachieve nationally every year. And here in Leicester, our underachievement has actually increased. Okay. To these very traditional white English texts, like A Christmas Carol and An Inspector Calls, which they just can't engage with. Okay. I've talked to my history colleagues and they've talked about the fact that they can include Windrush and the migration when they talk about migration to the UK post-war, but it's very much down to the teacher that's teaching it. So I'm interested as a group of educators, particularly in higher education, whether you have any pragmatic suggestions for me to take back to my colleagues as to how we can try and make that curriculum more engaging for our youngsters and become more representative of us. Thank you, Julie. Robert, would you like to give your perspective, please? It's quite interesting because um, I have a son who's in secondary school, he's in year 10 at the moment, and we often discuss uh, how, how the curriculum reflects, um, how, ref how it reflects him, and how does he then be able to get engaged with the curriculum. And again, he's one of those young men that are, is, is quite nonchalant about a lot of things, but when it comes to um, things that he finds appropriate that he can engage in, he very often struggles. And so some of the, um, the texts that Julie just mentioned are the similar ones that he has at school. And then we try to bring that into um, a situation at home. And so we have to educate them at home where they have the information about the wind rush, where they have information about their heritage uh, um, from the Caribbean, and then take it even further um, the, about their ancestry from Africa. And, and from, that res from that perspective, he gets his diet of it. But um, there's a situation whereby that isn't across the board where everybody has access to these things, where everybody has at least um, 
a significant adult that can pass on this information to them. So I do see where there's a gap there. I do see there's, there is, there's an increasing problem there that really does need to be addressed. Uh, with regards to the solutions, it, it can be as simple as introducing one of these texts into the actual curriculum, whereby you know, a member of, st well, well, whereby the, the departments can get a, a, a grip onto it and use that information to then disseminate across the actual, um, the other departments and say, well, this is the kind of thing that we're embracing. Um, what do you think? But it's a brave and bold step because once you're in a comfort zone and it's quite easy whereby there's a specific text that is um, run through the curriculum, you're, you're, you're okay with that. It's, it's, it's something that keeps you um, grounded whereby you think, well, I know this text is something I've done on a regular basis. I've done it for a number of years. I know it inside out. So therefore, for me to then jump and do something completely different, which is way out of my comfort zone, is to an extent a big ask for some members of staff. And it's a big ask for um, schools to be brave enough to do that. But in, in the same token, there'll be young boys, um, girls, They'll be crying out for these sort of things, crying out for you know, an alternative, a change, a bit of a difference, whereby they can say, well, I can actually engage with this. Because there are aspects, we know to, um, to Kill a Mockingbird, it covers the aspects of slavery. But then you, students will say, well, I don't really feel empowered by some of those things because to slavery, again, still makes me feel that you know, I, I'm still kept down at the bottom, I'm still having to battle. When you're introducing literature which shows people are actually striving against uh, adversity and they are actually rising to the top, then students feel more engaged in that. And it's not just a case of the black students. You know, it also in, in encourages uh, non-black students to get a clearer insight of you know, what goes on in the school and what goes on for people who are of the same colour as them. So for me, it is a brave and bold step, but um, it is a step that does need to be taken. I'm going to pause for a second and just ask you a question, um, Robert. Yeah. Um, since we're being radical, I can do this. Okay. It's not a traditional <laughs> um, so there's, there's, there's an argument about um, the literature that's introduced to children at a young age, but there's also another argument that speaks to practices in the classroom um, that we consider racist. And as, okay. as, as, as an educator, Maybe you can share with us some of the challenges or some, of, some examples of how you've had to come, overcome some of those anti-racist practices. Yeah, that, that's, um, it's, that's a difficult scenario to be in, um, to even consider, because how it works for professionals it, 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 you know, in teaching, they, they'll often say throwaway comments. And these throwaway comments that they're using, it, to them it's something that is totally innocent. It, 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 it is absolutely... That there's no malice behind it you know, with their in initial intention. But then how it's received by um, a young person is very different. The way that information is translated is very different. So, for example, um, of mice and men, uh, in, in the story of mice and men, there, there, there's a term that they use in there uh, that makes reference to a derogative term to a black person. And um, I was in a school whereby the boys, it was a boys' school, and the boys came to me and said, oh, they found some of the literature or some of the, yeah, the words within that book, they, they found it quite offensive and they brought that to the attention of the member of staff. And the member of staff said, well, you need to get over it because it's part of the curriculum. This book is on our, is on our curriculum. This, po this book is part of what we teach in year, year 10 and year 11. So just get over it. And that was a response that the boys had. And if you say that to a, a teenage boy, you know, you know, whereby it's a word that they know you know, it has strong connotations and, has, and, and to a extent can be used to belittle them. If you just say to them, just get over it, well, that's not what's going to happen. They automatically switch to the negative and say, well, I'm not getting the support from the member of staff who's supposed to be here you know, to help me and guide me through this process. And so as a member of staff, I approached that member of staff. And, and again, but it is difficult because she was using you know, the curriculum you know, as a shield and say, well, these aren't, this isn't reflecting my opinion. This, this isn't reflecting how I am. However, it's there on the curriculum, so therefore I'm using this as my teaching tool. Mm -hmm. So don't take it personal, mm -hmm. which is a very difficult and bitter pill to swallow when, when you're trying to say, well, 
we're trying to raise people who are tolerant here and we don't just make comments just for the sake of making comments and just say it is what it is and deal with it you know we need to break these things down and make it clear but then again it's, it's me talking about being in, the, in that comfort zone where you're saying well I have this curriculum to hide behind I have this set already so therefore I don't need to think beyond that so whatever connotation that it may have behind it that's not the issue it's the facts that remains and well that's what we need to be challenging so these situations the anecdotes that I have are, aren't they're not rare you know in fortune there are situations that they crop up on a regular basis that again need to be challenged thanks uh, Riaz you have another perspective to share with us um, good afternoon everyone um, I think I've written slightly more than uh, perhaps I should have so I'm going to try and um, give, give a streamlined version um, firstly it's a great honor to speak um, um, I'm an ex-student of, of DMU so though I was a fine arts student my mum thinks I was becoming a doctor um, <laughs> she's still convinced till today um, just to set a context look locally we know there's there's generally um, uh, massive pockets of underperformance and it's a designated priority area for low standards and, and lowest capacity to improve in social mobility some of the deprivation indicators for my school and many schools and, and our surrounding areas for our schools are really concerning but on this backdrop um, of a school two schools um, with significantly high percentages of EAL and significantly high numbers of pupil premium and free school meals we've been able to yield um, very successful numbers and, I, and I'm going to use that to um, not only promote the school uh, but to um, answer what we've done in terms of a curriculum sense but in terms of how we conf confront not only racism but all forms of hate and really have a curriculum and a program and a learning journey that meets the needs of, of students. So um, last year our girls school in particular was uh, the 35th best performing school in the country you know from right bang in the middle of high fields from where I grew up as a, from a single parent family and I want our students to have dreams far beyond any dreams that I've ever had um, and they are doing it. I've, I've, I've got girls that are just achieving numbers that East Midlands has never seen before in the last two years which proves if the curriculum is reflective of the needs of its students and reflective of their aspirations and, and instills the values and ambition that they have they can achieve toe-to-toe -to -toe with all of those grammar schools that I glanced at when we got that 35th place. I looked and I looked amongst all of the schools and I thought, that's our girls that have done that. From struggling families, from families that really have been set up not to do as well as their peers, from all of the affluent and leafy areas in the country, but they have. And what does that tell you? That tells you that um, it starts with leadership, it starts with a real mindset of change, a real belief in your students from day one, a belief that they can do and achieve whatever they want to. But as a leader, it shows that your, your responsibility is um, to instill that mindset in your staff and to use that infrastructure to change the structures and processes that you have within your school, to not to accept, accept second best because of someone's background or affluency. Our disadvantaged students for the second year running now have outperformed their peers. It just doesn't happen. It's happened because we program our learning journey for every single student, for pockets to some extent. And we are a faith designated school, but we represent the entire world in our school. In nearly every country you could think of, every area of Africa and every area of Europe and every area of the Indian subcontinent and beyond. But we bring it all together with our shared values. And one last point I'd like to mention is um, something about the heart. Our heart values are very, very important to us. Um, they are honesty, um, excellence, accountability, respect, and tolerance. And we don't just instill these from day one. We actually believe in them. They are the prism through which our students learn. Our curriculum is known as heart and mind. The mind is the latter. People think we're an exams factory. We're not. We're actually about having an identity for our students so they believe in themselves but they have the character and the leadership to then learn that purposeful knowledge that ambitious knowledge all of all of the what we fill their minds with only works if they have the character and leadership to then use it and make the world better better than in reality what we've done with the world so our heart values is something i really sell we expect the entire learning community to buy into it 
and I did use an example, and I would like to use that example, the great, and what better day to mention him. I mentioned Martin Luther King at our inset day, and he, re he really reminded me about what, when I started headship and senior leadership, what I wanted from my school. I wanted happy students that are proud of their identity, proud of their color of their skin, proud of their faith, proud of all of the different layers that they are as British young people. And our heart and what I really brought in in the, in the, in the last three years is really encapsulated by an example that I read only recently. And I'll end with this. And he said, um, in order to con condemn injustice, people must go through four stages. And I thought those four stages were just beautiful because it just linked exactly to what we are trying to do at our schools. And number one was to ascertain the facts that injustices are indeed being perpetrated. So you actually look for facts. We're in a time of fake news and polarized views. Actual facts, actual metrics, not just hearsay, not just labeling certain communities, not Islamophobia, not just you know, willy-nilly comments that are just made. Number two, to negotiate, to approach the oppressor. And that could be the local authority or bodies who have the mandate of change and by demanding change and demanding justice. And three and four, which really brought a tear to my eye. Um, Self-purification, number three. And we've got to remember the time when he wrote this letter. Asking ourselves, are we ourselves oppressors? And I remember saying this to our staff. We always believe as staff we know best. We always, every single person has the capacity of good and bad, regardless of who we are. Every faith, every person of every background has the ability to do good and bad. No one has the monopoly on good or bad. So asking ourselves first. And then number four, very, very importantly, removing one's own wrong before demanding justice from others. And I asked my staff, I said, I don't care if you do nothing else. Forget the rest of inset, forget the pedagogy, the subject knowledge, all the things we've talked about. If your heart is clear and with pure intention and that purity of intention and wanting the best for your students, everything else will take care of itself. And it was very emotional in set actually this year because we lost a student. And just ironically, I'd planned this and, and he passed away just before inset. And he had a defect heart. But he had a beautiful heart. He had a better heart than most people. And when I went to the funeral, all they spoke about is the curriculum and the learning experience and how he loved school and how he wasn't made to feel second best in his school because everything reflected who he is. And that's all he left with and that's ultimately all that mattered because the substance of education and the curriculum and everything we do for our young people is about them being happy and being rounded, the whole child and every child, not just metrics because the metrics of we've shown will take care of themselves. Thank you. Just before you start, Camille, um, there have been lots of, lots of um, emotive conversations today, I would say, that have drawn out emotions, but that particularly just touched me a little bit, brought a tear to my eye. So, um, Camille, thank you. Um, Camille's um, going to bring another perspective to the conversation, that is of... Um, well, we know, number one, that there are just not enough black teachers. Secondly, there are um, barriers that black teachers face in getting to those leadership positions. And you're going to share with us a perspective on, on, on that, aren't you? I am. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and I'm really sorry that I'm following on from you <laughs> because, <laughs> because the picture I'm going to present is a bit depressing. Um, so I apologise ahead of time. Um, context. Um, I was elected the first black president of the Leicester National Education Union, um, the first black president after 150 years. And I, I was pleased, yes, my family were pleased, um, my colleagues were pleased, but I also felt it was a damning indictment on the education profession that it took 150 years for them to elect somebody of another colour that wasn't white. I qualified as a teacher in 1990 and I, I recognise right from the start that we stand on the shoulders of the giants that came, come before us and I recognise that every single day in terms of my teaching and what I do. The, st the stats tell us this, um, the racial disparity audit of 2017 confirmed that racial disadvantage and discrimination is widespread within our school system. Um, the TES, the Times Educational Supplement, in 2017, just two years ago, 
said that racial inequality within our school system is deep-rooted, endemic and institutionalised. So when you ask me about the current status of the teaching profession, I'm going to throw some things out at you. Um, the public perception when I say I'm a teacher is, is poor you. Um, which age group do you teach, 11 to 16? Oh dear. Um, is it a mixed school? Well, it was predominantly a boys' school for a number of years. So it's a case of people saying, oh my goodness. So the impression of teachers generally is that we're a hard, you know, we come from a, a poor background, so to speak, in terms of what we have to do. We've had 10 years as a profession of no pay rises. We've suffered school cuts, underfunding, and in 2017, the BBC stated that the number of BME teachers would need to double to accurately reflect the ethnic makeup of the state school system, the pupil population. So it would have to double in order to reflect the community it serves. And that's one of the things that I think that the McPherson report talks about, the community being reflected in terms of um, who they serve, in terms of what we do. Um, in terms of progression, only 3.2% of um, head teachers are non-white and BME teachers are massively underrepresented in leadership. Teachers from BME backgrounds experience every day racism, discrimination, harassment, lack of pay progression, being held back from promotion to senior management posts and headships, and within the National Education Union, as black teachers, we also see, b believe that these are still barriers in the profession. So when you ask me what part does that play in attracting black teachers to the profession, or black people to the profession, I'd say it's a, you know, in order for you to want to teach, it is a vocation. You don't do it for the money. Yeah, you don't do it because people think that it's you know, a profession to be um, respected. You do it because it's a vocation and you think it's something that somebody has to do it. Do we? Somebody have to do it? No, the best people have to do it. That's what I'm going to say. Um, at present, we know that BME teachers struggle to qualify in terms of initial teacher education. Um, I was talking about this about three, four years ago. I was saying that with school cuts, you're going to have a retrenchment mentality happening in the education profession. So whereas you had probably about 10 years ago, the encouragement of black teachers into the profession, where you have cuts, you will see that the, where you might have had the um, policy where first in, last in, first out, it doesn't work like that anymore. You could be the most experienced, the most qualified black teacher, and you're more likely to be pushed out of your job than somebody who's been teaching for two years and is white. Yeah? You are more likely to be, and this is about funding. It's about funding, but it's also about race. So why do black teachers still come into the profession? Why do we stay in the profession? Because we believe that we can be positive role models for our young people. We believe that we can inspire them to overcome the disadvantage that they face out in, on the street, out in public, and that's the reason why we're in the profession. So my parting words on this, and I'm sorry it's not as happy as it should be, is that if we don't organise, if we don't mobilise, then we will perish. And that is the reality of black teachers today, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to open it up to the floor to um, take questions, and Julie, I'm going to let you uh, choose who should answer that question. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, excellent. The young lady at the front.
the impending increases are talking in this coming in, in September. Uh, and there's a lot of talk about no outsiders and, and LGBT inclusivity and stuff like that. Um, I'm uh, the hate crime coordinating officer for Harrogate and Enfield, and I'm putting on a, um, uh, a number of events for Hate Crime Awareness Week, one of which is an inclusive roundtable discussion about um, the inclusive um, uh, curriculum. Um, but what I'm doing is I'm using the kind of no outsiders dialogue and spreading it to all diversity strains. So I asked, whereas we were having a conversation about LGBT inclusivity, what does that look like when you're talking about race, when you're talking about religion, when you're talking about uh, uh, gender, sexual identity, and all those things, and, pro and intersectional. So I was perhaps suggesting that we should ride the, the horse in the direction it's, it's, it's traveling. If we've got a more inclusive um, curriculum coming in, perhaps we need to make use that as a catalyst and then spread it outwards to meet in some of the, um, the topics that we want to have at the table. The problem is we've just started a new national curriculum, so we've got a few years before it's going to be reviewed again. Um, somebody made a point in one of the workshops earlier that as a community we're a bit more clued up now on how health services work. And right here in Leicester um, in October I went to a panel discussion where they involved the whole community about what services we want. When the time for that happened on education, and the time has passed for the next few years, it was a very insular, inside club. We weren't even particularly invited. We could comment on the web, but we weren't asked as a union what we thought. We weren't asked as black teachers what we thought. So whilst we want to make it more inclusive, at the moment we need to strategize so that we're there at that next layer for the next time that that conversation happens. Okay? So we're, we're, we're at the front door. We're opening the door to the kids. We're greeting them at the door. You know, we're giving them the examples that we can give on a day-to-day. -day, but the decisions that were made about which reading book they would read for two to three years in some context till they knew it inside out and hated the book, um, wasn't made by us, okay? What about um, using the momentum of the LGBT community? The LGBT community works like a very oiled machine. It's strategic in the way that it does things. But what people don't know, which I was taught by one of my, um, my gay colleagues, is that the LGBT movement was actually started by black women. It was the Stonewall movement. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, They are. And actually, at uh, one of our recent conferences in Birmingham, um, the lead speaker was a member, a quite a politically strong member of the LGBT community. And it is about us as a black people being more political. And it is about us being on the governing bodies. And it is about us being on the local council representative. Here in Leicester, which is held up as the city of multiculturalism, we have three black councillors, miss? Three black councillors? Three. Oh. Four? Four? Apologies, for African Caribbean black, yes, within the whole of Leicester City. And we need to be much more organized so that we have that voice because what you've said is that the LGBT committee, co sorry, community have made sure that they are organized politically, yes? Okay. Um, gentleman at the back with the hat. Last speaker. There you go. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't quite recall your name. So, um, first off, I mean, if you're speaking the facts, I mean, I don't know if there's a need to apologize for that. So, it doesn't even matter where it's positioned. You're just telling your truth. You know, I just felt like I needed to say that. But I'm very interested in your very last comment that you made in respect of uh, you said that um, some of the most seasoned teachers who are black might be the first ones to be out in the, you know, the sort of school cut kind of context. But you made two distinctions. You said that's about race and that's about money. I'm very interested to know how that distinction is set up um, in terms of money specifically. Um, how is that not 
about race, if you would explain. In other words, you're, you're saying that these are the two factors that might influence how that works, and I'm just yeah. curious to know how yeah. you're making that distinction. Yeah, I think I should say that, that if I was on a, um, if I was higher up on the tree, I suppose um, I say there are lots of factors why there is the disparity, why we have black teachers being forced out of the profession. But from the National Education Union's perspective, we have a number of cases of black teachers um, who are being forced out of the profession. Um, now, and, and some of them are being forced out, some of them are choosing to leave, all right? But in the same breath, there are a number of cases right across the country where you will find um, the discussion that's being had is that if you can have, let's say, two or three newly qualified teachers, you can pay them, yeah, you can pay them, um, let's say, 10, 12,000 pounds less for doing exactly the same job as somebody who's been in the profession 12, 15 years. Am I? No, absolutely. Yeah. So I just wanted to double check that. Um, yeah, so, so that's what we find. And so, and as I said, you, where you had a, um, we had a perspective where um, probably about 10 years ago, there was a lot of push about having black teachers in the profession. You had um, a rise in people being qualified to become head teachers, a great push on multiculturalism in terms of education, etc. Um, and it seems to have cut, turned full circle in the sense that now that we're in a time of cuts, now that we're in a time, it's the most expensive teachers that are going, and nine times out of ten. So my question is, in a way, joining up, uh, again, forgive me, I, I, I don't know your names, um, joining up these two conversations about um, political strategization. I mean, how do you navigate that in light of the fact that in the in the in the context of cuts in the education system mm -hmm. it's it appears to be uh, black teachers who are primarily being sacrificed in those mm -hmm. fires I mean is there not an opportunity there for a certain kind of um, mobilization around the need to address this as a serious and institutional problem in other words uh, in the way in which the system is currently working, it becomes another way in which race becomes um, a, 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 a means of excluding and becomes a barrier. I mean, yeah. is there not that opportunity and is that being explored? We are doing it. We are doing it. I can say that there's the discussion about, um, I think the discussion in educational circles is less about racism and more about unconscious bias. And so you'll hear the discussion being said, the, the talk will be, no, it's not a race issue. It, you may be seeing it as something that it actually isn't. Okay? So we understand that. Yes, I think we are um, strategizing. I think in terms of our union um, involvement that we're involved in, I think in schools like yours where, it, yes, it's faith, it's a faith school, but in the same respect, you have... You're an example of a black head teacher. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I think we're strategizing in a lot of different fronts in the sense that some of us are having our own schools. We're creating our own schools. In other respects, there are um, us organizing and pulling together, networking. So with the Black Teachers Network in Leicester, which is probably the biggest black teacher network in the East Midlands, um, we're organizing and supporting um, black teachers in order to ensure that they are kept in their jobs and they're supported in their jobs. So it's not that we're laying down and accepting it, but it's, we're fighting at lots of different fronts in order to do it. The gentleman here in the black hat's been waiting for one. Okay. Just, I, I've got two questions, actually. Um, in terms of response to the issue around um, staffing being sort of pushed out in the teaching profession. The TUC recently produced a, a report that suggests that black 
employers generally, both in health services, across the board, are being pushed out by employees and more likely to face disciplinary actions or dis unfair dismissal. So in terms of the issue around um, teachers or professionals or black professionals, it's across the board. It's not a unique thing in, um, in, in um, teaching or in the teaching profession. The question I wanted to actually ask was more to do with the, the curriculum issue and concern. I think, I think schools are put under pressure anyway to sort of deliver this very dry and outdated um, curriculum sort of written on the back of, a, I think, a fag paper with uh, um, Mr. Gove, who was, yeah, uh, anyway. But what I was going to say, I mean, I think as teachers or as schools, you do have a much more flexibility in Key Stage 3 and can be slightly more strategic in terms of introducing, I suppose, a more wider, um, and there are some schools that are doing that, mm. and that's in terms of introducing a wider book selection to encourage young uh, uh, young people from all backgrounds, but especially young black children, to read books or exposed to art and sort of creative stuff that perhaps they won't it, it be acknowledged in Key Stage 4. So you've got kind of a window of opportunity in, key, in Year 7, 8, and perhaps a little bit of Year 9 before they choose their options. And strategically, we should, as of a union, but also as a group, actually try and sort of decolonize that part of the curriculum so that it can be seen as a, as a, yeah. Anyway, you were going to speak next. I, I, I think I said what I said. Because I, I could go on and on and on, but I don't want to. Can I come on the front? Hey. I don't think you Cheers, Miss. Um, can I just say a general response, and I thank you for the questions. Um, I'm not here to deny some of the numbers Camille mentioned at all. I concur with them, absolutely. I'm just here trying to say it doesn't need to be that way. Absolutely. Neither, neither with the curriculum, yeah. neither with staffing, neither with any of these areas. Yeah. I've built a school in the vision of me. I was a single parent family. Um, brought up in a single parent family. My mum could not speak English and that's how I was brought up, always been thinking that I'm second best um, and a second class citizen. I was told in college and in secondary school that I will never make it. I was literally told by teachers, you should just leave. You're just not going to do it. Because I do have different ideas and maybe we are doing things differently, but I think we've proven it can be done differently. I actively look for a reflective workforce. I go out looking for certain individuals so our work... Everyone thinks our, our staff are all of the same faith. My leadership team is... OK, there's me from the Indian subcontinent, but there's Jamaican, a Canadian, English... Um, what is that? South African... Um, all of different faiths, all of different colours. We have an atheist in there. Because we all believe in the same vision. It doesn't matter who you are. Our heart values are not just faith values. They are universal values. And in terms of the curriculum, curriculum is just... The national curriculum is only a starting point. Mm -hmm. It's only the starting parameters of what a curriculum should look like. Yeah. If you're truly ambitious as a school, you should be going well beyond that. Because if you're... Not, if you're not engaging with your stakeholders, primarily your students and your and your your parents and your community, to build that learning journey, they're the ones that are going to learn. Yeah. Our mantra is we're here to learn. They're the ones there to learn. They're not going to learn if they don't care about the substance of what you are teaching them. Make it meaningful and they will learn and they will dream. And I guess that's what I'm saying. I absolutely yeah. agree. I've been to schools before where I've taught and I went through the system and I thought, I don't belong here and I don't feel like I would want to be here either as a and that's as a student as a, and as a member of staff. I taught in Leamington, mm -hmm. leafy, affluent Leamington. And I felt totally out of place as a high fields lad. I thought, what on earth is going on here? You know, I was going to parents' evenings and people were putting dictaphones on the table to record me. I thought, whoa, everyone's got a million, million pound house. I felt out of place. But I was adamant that when I finally have that power, and if leadership 
is what contributes to school improvement, the biggest contributing factor. It comes back to the staffing. If we get a more reflective um, body of leaders in this country in all of the areas where we can make change, you will see change. Because I've just done it in a small pocket of my two schools. But that's where it starts. We need to get into those positions where we have a voice. Um, that's it. Um, I'm also a head of English, so I've seen the change in the English curriculum over the past 20 years or so. And, um, but I've always taught English from a world literature perspective. So even when um, the curriculum changed two years ago, I was looking for African, Caribbean, Asian writers of the 19th century because I wanted our young people to understand that writing didn't just begin with Charles Dickens and there are black writers who are writing at exactly the same time. And that's, that's not, it's not, um, I'm not an exception. And I think as well, it just means that you do the research and we'll all be doing it. And so therefore, the curriculum will reflect the children that we teach. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. So. Educated, one educated to one um, the hot topic at the moment is exclusions. If we are part of no more exclusions, we are looking to abolish. We do not believe in reforming exclusions, we do not believe in reducing exclusions. And with the new initiative coming in, zero tolerance of behavior, which means that uh, our children will be excluded quicker than we can say ABC, how do you feel that we should be approaching that? <laughs> See, the issue behind um, the, the zero tolerance thing is, 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 is schools trying to tackle behaviour on, on, a, on a wide and broad scale. And when schools are constantly under the microscope, which obviously they are, of Ofsted, who say, well, we're no longer focusing on, you know, on, um, on data anymore. We're looking at on how the school is operating as a whole and how it's reflective of the actual students. The idea of, of, of um, this no exclusions or, 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 and then pairing that with zero tolerance, it, it's a very unhappy combination because the schools want to have this, 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 this idea whereby every student is welcome, every student when they enter the gates or walk through the doors that they are going to be um, treated as an individual and so therefore for them their experience is going to be almost bespoke towards them. So when they go through from year seven through to year 11, they should be feeling that they've gone through that school and that they've been represented and they've, uh, they've been able to learn and they can leave there saying they are the, um, the full and rounded individual, which is, which is the approach, which sounds fantastic. And, you know, in an ideal world, that is exactly what you'd want. You want your child to go to a school and come out of the, on the other end thinking, you know, this great experience wasn't just about me achieving um, X amount of, grades set seven to nine because that's what people will be looking for you know they, they'll be able to stretch the curriculum and say well, I'm actually more rounded because I have extra strings to my bow that demonstrates I'm, I'm a character that can go into the big wide world and demonstrate tolerance and, de and demonstrate an understanding for difference and be that person that's going to thrive and progress in, in society amongst other people but then you're faced with a situation whereby there are some people, or there, there are some individuals who find it difficult to, to access that information or access that, that, um, that approach that the school is trying to deliver. And because they find it difficult to gain access to what the school has to deliver, they're then seen as the, um, the students who are the problem. They are seen as the students that if you can't get on board, then we need to shift you else onto somewhere else, shift you, shift you onto somewhere else. Which then becomes a problem again because then it becomes that, that, that self-perpetuating situation whereby they have this idea, well, you clearly don't want me here, and so therefore, if you don't want me here, I'm going to go elsewhere, and if I'm demonstrating the same sorts of behaviours, that means I'll just achieve very little because the expectation is that I'm going to achieve very little. So when it comes to this idea of, well, there, there's no exclusions, um, that would be brilliant because that means the school has to maintain and, and look after those students who don't fit into this particular um, picture, this particular framework, 
and keeps them on board and says, well, we're now creating something that's going to be this bespoke idea, which is what we're trying to be aiming for, and ensure that they can engage with the curriculum, they can engage with the whole school ethos and the whole school environment and thrive with everybody else. But again, we talk about risk, we talk about being pragmatic, we talk about this idea of being that, being that school that's going to say we don't get rid of students, we don't offlay our students to somebody else. Because we had this whole issue whereby schools were um, off, offlaying students, so therefore they're not on the record, and so therefore they're not, in, they're not going to impact on their results. And that was a very sneaky backdoor route of dealing with these situations. So often they say, well, no, we're, 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 we're doing away with all that sort of stuff. You know, we want to see what you have in place to deal with these students, whereby you can keep them on board and be part of that big picture. So, yeah, it is great. You know, this idea is, is really great and, you know, and it's admirable. But schools are still faced with a situation where, although it's not data-driven, there are still resources that they still need to maintain. And a school will say, well, if they get this impression that they hold on to naughty kids and naughty kids, whether they're actually naughty, whether they do fit, fit that picture, which is what we're really saying they don't, it's just an easy way of getting rid of them. What the school is then saying is, we still need students to come to our school. Because students don't come to our school, we don't have any money. If we don't have any money, well then there's no school, then that's where it becomes that problem of trying to get that balance of giving that image outside of the, of the, into the community that we are a school that is nurturing and we look after every single student, but also wanting to challenge students and also maintaining that there's a, there's a clear behavior policy, there's a clear no tolerance, zero tolerance, that there's an expectation that you toe the line. But it can be done because there, there's... there's um, the Michaela School, you know, it's a very clear example of whereby, you know, you can take on board, you know, students who are considered to be the more challenging individuals who have a background whereby they, it's not what you consider to be a conventional background whereby students are going to thrive. They take them on board and they demonstrate this no zero tolerance. And they're saying because it's about, it's about no excuses, it's about rigor, you know, it's about being brave and sometimes saying, you may not like this, but you know what? It's for the greater good. And once you get a situation like that, then, then you can come into place. I, I agree with you, right? I totally agree with you. But where you have a situation, and I'm not saying that this happens everywhere, and it's probably what most people do anyway, but you have some children, well, one of isolated children, that may decide they're going to pick up a chair in anger, frustration, and fling it across the classroom, and they'll get excluded for that. My argument is, if the curriculum alienates them, if the teachers that they are dealing with alienate them, the frustration of youth is that I don't know what to do, so I'm lashing out. We have a responsibility as the adults to be able to guide our young people to behave in the right way, to manage their anger, and to be able to channel it positively. And the only way they can do that is an environment that nurtures them, in a curriculum that supports them, with staff that reflect them. And that's where we are right now. We have a couple more minutes, so yes, we can take one or two more questions. One just here. is reflective of your mm. pupils. I'm just wondering, how exactly have you done that? How have you mm. fostered that nurturing and appropriate curriculum for your particular students? Strong subject leadership and school council. 
How if, I, you... if, I was to re if I was to really simplify the answer, it's talking to young people, um, finding out where the barriers to learning are, particularly in, in, in directly in terms of um, the themes that they are covering and why what is disengaging them. Um, and I'd, I'd link it to what Camille has just said and some of the questions about exclusion. We've never had an exclusion. We have the same kids that all of our surrounding schools have. We, it's, we've just never, ever excluded. Because if I believe, it's simple stuff, if kids are happy and they, and they want to come to school, they will learn. It, it, it's not even that complicated. But I would, I'm ambivalent on exclusion. I don't believe in zero tolerance because exclusions are far more complex than that. Because... You know, there can be a situation where the wider deterrent for all the other students has to be in play, particularly for teachers attack. We may not have excluded before, but we have taken on students. There was one student who attacked a member of staff in year 10, and we took him on, and he did fantastic with us, got some fantastic outcomes. So I would never rule out the whole program, because it's worked. It's really useful. It worked for him. But we but did. It worked the other way. But we managed to... And a curriculum isn't always just a horizontal thing. It's a vertical thing. And it's a cohort and a student and the alternative curriculum for certain students based on different needs and attainment is far more complex than this is the English curriculum mm -hmm. um, vertically and so on. It's, it's got to be, the intricacies are, are far too complex. So sometimes you'll get a student, just one student, and it is easier for us because we're two very smaller than average schools, um, where you pick a student and you provide a program specific for, for that student. Kanetta, did you have something to add? it and then with your what's happening with uh with with your school uh Riaz and I guess I'm just sort of wondering where do you it seems to be more that there's also headspace to actually do some thinking about how do we take this national curriculum and actually do something different and think about the community that we're serving, the student body that we're serving, and, and for instance, even the example that you raised about um, the student who would come in, uh, that would, you know, might come in and have a challenging situation that has specific needs that need to be addressed, that also requires a kind of headspace. And I'm just sort of wondering, you know, within the environments in which you're working in, where is that? Is there possibility for that? You know, how are you supported in that? Where does, where can that come from? Because it sounds like the teacher who is at a point where it's just like, this is the curriculum and whatever, they're not thinking even about what that curriculum is at all. They're just reading off a sheet of paper and, and the curriculum could be whatever. It just, you know, so I'm just sort of wondering about that. There is a hierarchy. And obviously, Riaz is at the top of the um, <laughs> food chain. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Stop at the food chain. Um, as we're sitting here, it's interesting that both Camille and Riaz were part of the same program to get more ethnic minority head teachers into school, as I was sitting here reflecting. Um, but So the teacher that Robert talked about is at the bottom of the food chain and is being told by her head of department, and I had this same argument just this week. A colleague of mine said, you know what, actually this text would more suit my students, and she was told by her head of department that under no uncertain terms was she to deviate from the scheme of work, every student, every 275 student in that year group was to do the same text, okay? And so Riaz decided to do a bespoke curriculum for one young person. He has the power to make that decision, yeah. Yeah. yes? But unless we're represented at that table, we can't have those conversations. Some 10 years ago, I was on a similar scheme to try and get more leadership into the East Midlands, and we're still on 3%. It was 3% 10 years mm -hmm. ago, and it's still 3% mm -hmm. today. And until we have that seat at the table, those conversations aren't going to happen. The lady over there in the glasses is waiting. Um, who gave the lecture earlier? Um, yes. an English literature teacher and, and a media studies teacher, and I know the curriculum changed again. Um, but 
the creative subjects as well as those considered vocational like business studies um, are being squeezed out of our schools and I think there is a correlation with the amount of exclusions because we would often get the kids that weren't fitting into history or geography because of the limitations and uh, as soon as Progress 8 came in, my, my subject intake got cut in half automatically. And I just think that that's not always raised in the conversation. And year on year, since Progress 8, there's been 20% less uptake of GCSE and A-level creative subjects. And I think that is reflective in that there used to be spaces where we could shape a curriculum to mm. meet our students very easily in ways that we couldn't in, in core subjects. And I just think that they were often havens for students mm. that just weren't able to express themselves in any kind of way. And I think it's a shame that they've been squeezed out. Mm. And we're now, our university um, ACI subjects are getting cut because it's now it's hitting that level mm -hmm. and I think it's something that needs to be thought about and trying to protect those subjects and those teachers as well. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more. From the other back. Oh. Yeah. <coughs> Hi I've just come for this last panel discussion so I may have missed some of this earlier in the day but Thanks, really lovely to hear from you. I was an early years teacher. I was a reception class teacher in Leicester for five years. The system broke me. I'm now working across the whole of the city. I've sort of come back meaner and stronger to try and do system change around voice and agency. So I'm working on a Leicester citywide project to think about how we support communication language. Um, from birth to 25, really. So I was really interested in your points about listening to students. How is it, as educators, we can actually encourage voice and agency? Um, <laughs> it's <email. laughs> Go on ahead. I, I spend most of my day, um, instead of looking at the screen, just talking to the young people, mm -hmm. um, be it in classrooms, um, I have, you, you know the boy I mentioned earlier with the defect heart? He had this routine where he'd knock on my door and come and see me. He was a SEN student, but he'd give me feedback on something every single day. And I actually missed that the most. Um, it was always about 10, 10-ish when I was having a cup of tea at break time. And I miss his knock on the door. When anyone else knocks, I'm just so used to it after, you know, from se year seven to nine. Um, but my door, when I say it's, it's an open door for staff, I... I'd love you all to come to my school because we literally, I literally have an open door policy. Our classrooms are open door policy and young people just drop in and say, sir, this is rubbish or we should do this or we should do this. And normally I go, yeah, all right, let's do it. You're doing it. And as simple as that, just listening. If it's crazy, explaining why, you know, we can't build a rocket, <laughs> we, can't get a, we can't get a bus and put it in the middle of the playground and turn it into a classroom. It's good. It'd look amazing because I'm fine art background. I'd love to do it. And our fine art's fantastic art school, by the way. We don't squeeze it. Fight for the arts. I'd, I'd, I'd always argue that. But just sit and speak to young people. <coughs> just strip it down to basics. They're so when, when it comes to pedagogy, sometimes, you know, when we, when we were training, you read so much. And really, all we're really doing is just the simple things that... You know, my my seven-year-old daughter gives me some of the best ideas I go and then take credit for. <laughs> She came in one day when she was ill, um, and she wandered around. There was a few things she said about our canteen and the way it was set up. She goes, oh, Dad, that's, that's rubbish. That's not going to work. How would you do it? Oh, I'd do this. I'm like, oh, OK. <laughs> I went, then, I'm, then, then I've launched it, and they've gone, yeah, that makes really sense. Because you know, I'm from a design background. You just listen to the consumer, and they will give you the best answers. And then you might need to tweak it slightly and, and work out the nuances of it. But if you genuinely, that's, this is the difference. This is what the entire panel, I think, the recurring theme is. If you've got people in positions that genuinely have the mindset of change and want to listen and want to make change, then it will happen. These metrics aren't there by chance. They're there because people are doing some of the superficial things, but they're not doing it enough. Someone mentioned Michaela. I'm not going to go on to Michaela. We're the opposite of Michaela. We do things in a very different way. I don't believe in that strong discipline like, Certain communities just need that. I, we, we do it in a different way. But it works, and those kids are getting high outcomes, so, yeah. you know, w fantastic. Um, but I think 
if, if that school was to develop in the next few years and, and, you, and you started to really get into the dialogue with those students, I think they'd want to maintain the outcomes. But perhaps I'm hoping some schools would then soften um, in terms of really embracing the student because that's five years of their life and education is, is you know, your whole youth and, and you want to be happy at a time of mental health. If we're not listening to our students, what, who are they listening to and who is listening to them? So that's, that's as simple as it is. Thank you. I think um, on that note, we will um, just say thank you very much to our panel. Um, <laughs> it's been a fantastic day of discussion. I'm sure you'll agree with me. And if you don't, please do feel welcome to feedback. Um, we will be sending out a survey tomorrow, I think. Um, so we'd encourage you all to fill in those, uh, those forms and send them back to us. Before we end, <coughs> sorry, I'd just like to say um, thank you to the people who have taken part today. Um, primarily, uh, Kenetta Hammond-Perry, who is the director of Stephen Lawrence Research Centre, and Melanie, uh, Richard, Mohammed, for having the vision to bring radical DMU to, um, sorry, radical ped pedagogies to DMU today. Um, it's been fantastic, thank you. Um, I'd also like to say thank you to our uh, fantastic events team. They pull out all the stops for us every single time we have an event. Um, to Claire Hurley and Tom Ritchie, who set up Radical Pedagogies in the first place. I'm not sure if they're still here, but I still wanted to... Oh, there you go, Claire, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, hope it continues. Um, finally, to everybody who's participated today, without you it wouldn't be such a great conference and we hope that you will support this next year as well. Thank you. Thank you.